Hi friendly friends, it's Amy from Savor Salvage Scent. Hope this finds you well in spite of the um, strange context of living in um, the days of COVID-19. Today I thought I would continue with a series um, dedicated to exploring Givenchy scents, um, which I kind of started last week. Um, while I've been exploring and collecting fragrance for about 30 to 35 years, there are so many perfumes and houses, um, trends to explore. Uh, just last year alone, I just read the other day that there were over a thousand perfume releases. Um, so for me, I started to collect around things that um, friends introduced me to and specific houses that I was first attracted to. So for me, that has meant um, things that were based on certain notes or um, the houses of Guerlain, of uh, Chanel and Caron. So there were tons to explore with that alone. But just recently, I, um, I keep reading about uh, Givenchy scents and I thought, oh my gosh, I really need to learn more about them. I know that some of them are, you know, incredible. And I had been considering um, which first few to maybe purchase and start to explore. And I had been looking at, I had been a, in a fragrance store, gosh, maybe a few months ago, pre-pandemic. Uh, and um, someone shared with me and said, based on what you like, I think that you'd really like um, Isatis, which is uh, a vintage scent uh, first released in 1984 by Givenchy. And I did a quick, um, you know, uh, scent strip that day and thought, oh my gosh, what, what a thing. It was just incredible. And it like, honestly, it just put everything else I smelled that day to, to shame. Um, I did not purchase it yet. So I've been thinking on it, and after I started releasing videos, a dear friend of mine um, was in, and I were communicating, and she reminded me that her um, her mother, who is just this beautiful and oh gosh, just incredibly warm and stylish uh, person in every way, wore or wears um, Isatis uh, as her signature scent, and then I was like right like this has to be the first one that I buy of course and um, I can totally see that so I um, purchased this um, partial vintage bottle online straight away um, isn't this beautiful it's uh, crystal it was really heavy like that's like a half a pound of butter right there um, I wanted to get a vintage version um, because, oh, so this was created first in 1984 and I thought, gosh, I want to get something close to when it was released so I really get it in its original context. And I'm so glad I did. So I started wearing this and testing it a few weeks ago off and on. I, I wanted to really live with it and, and you know, um, experience it and react to it. And also in that time, I purchased, I started kind of making a plan for purchasing some other um, vintage Givenchy scents and also some current releases so I could kind of just I wanted to better understand like where have they been where are they going what's the thread like in between um, do they have like a DNA like other houses have um, what are they like and um, yeah so I started wearing this a few weeks ago and maybe I'll just start by telling you a little bit more about the basics who created it um, and the, the notes and then we'll talk a little bit more about feelings feelings that we have um, so uh, this was first created by Dominique uh, Rivion who yeah, many of you will know he's a just like powerhouse uh, nose or perfume creator um, has me created many, many scents. I'll read to, to you some of them that he has uh, created. Uh, he's a French perfumer. So, uh, Amour Amour, many Burberry scents, um, Amis Moi, uh, Euphoria. He created Dune and Pure Poison for Dior, both just incredible uh, works of art. Um, and then more recently, um, many, many things, but uh, Girl of Now for... Um, Ely Saab, which is supposed to be an incredible uh, pistachio scent that I can't wait to uh, get my hands on, and many scents for, or at least I think two or three for um, the Frederick Mall line, one being Carnal Flower, 
which I have not smelled yet. I cannot believe that I know um, many people I respect think it's just one of the best ever created. So he is one of the noses I would say normally when I see he's created something, I'm like, I'm going to like it just based on the fact that he did it. It tends to be gutsy, really interesting compositions. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what I learned about the composition. Um, there are just so many notes and elements, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them to you and then we'll talk a little bit about um, what it, how it makes us feel. <laughs> um, so the top notes are uh, citrus, ylang ylang, galbanum, coconut, rosewood, and aldehydes. Really, I mean, hello, out of the gate, super interesting. The heart notes are jasmine, rose, iris, tuberose, and narcissus. So quite a lineup of florals. And then the bass notes, also incredibly interesting, are musk, amber, vanilla, vetiver, patchouli, sandalwood, and last but not least, civet. So let's talk a little bit about these notes and uh, what they bring to the scent. I'm actually gonna um, dab a little on as I talk. I, I put this on earlier today. Um, it is about five o'clock my time and I put this on at about 8.30 this morning. Still smells amazing. It has really changed though. This is such a deep composition that it does kind of shape shift over the day. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna uh, dab some of this. This is a, a dabber bottle. How cool is that? Um, and I'm gonna dab a little on my other wrist to give you an idea of um, what you get right when you first experience the scent to then this wrist, which is dry down. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'll say it's incredible and I think rare for a, a modern fragrance. So this is something that 1984 brings to the picture that you can still smell amazing eight, nine hours after. It's not as strong, of course, but um, this is this is still this is still working nine hours in. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the notes. Oh my gosh, and just um, the complexity of this uh, tremendous work of art. So um, this is one of those scents. There are just so many things involved that you're not going to pick everything out um, But it's masterful when somebody can put this many things together Balance it and create a work of art to me. It's just it's amazing and I'll tell you the things that that really jump off the skin or stand out for me. So um, in the top notes, I would say Ylang Ylang so this kind of interesting sweet funky floral um, galbanum, which is, if you're not familiar, it's like a mm, gummy resin from a plant. Um, and that plant is grown, I think, mostly in Iran. Um, and from my understanding, it is one of the oldest things used in scents, these resins. And in fact, it was first um, mentioned in the Bible and um, was used, it's talked about as being used for uh, incense. So super, super old um, element. And it has to me, I mean, it does lend this like incense-y quality. Um, the other thing that jumps out for me for the top notes are aldehydes. And um, again, aldehydes are these, these chemical, although they're found in the natural world, they're also chemical compositions that um, they're found naturally through things like um, barks, uh, rind of citrus, um, I think cinnamon, um, and they tend to have this sparkling champagne-like quality sometimes, or or a waxy kind of burnt candle quality. Um, there are many different kinds of um, aldehydes, and this one. I wouldn't say, it's not like, let's say, Chanel Number no. 5 or Chanel Cristal, where it, it feels sparkling and champagne-y to me, um, but it does create, like, I what I can best describe it as, as like a halo effect. So it's got this, um, mm, this ambiance or this, uh, it, it, it creates, yeah, a halo, this feeling. And yeah, so that's, that's what I would say about the aldehydes. Um, you definitely get that there are florals in here, but that is not to me what makes it stand out or what makes it 
its own composition. Um, those are, to me, kind of supporting players. The bass notes really stand out to me in addition to some of the top notes. Um, so for me, what really comes through are things that are musky and ambery and like honeyed vetiver um, and then patchouli and civet. So what does that mean? So here's, I wasn't ready for this scent. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. When I saw that it was created in 1984 and I saw this super artsy modern bottle, I was expecting what people call a hairspray floral from maybe the 80s or 90s. I was expecting white florals, which I, I love. A lot of people think that they're loud and, you know, whatever. I love them and I know exactly, I think, like what to expect. And I was prepared for me liking it in that way. Um, what I got instead that is amazing, but I was like kind of not ready for, was um, this to me is an amazing bridge between the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the reason I have some of these other scents up here is when I first smelled this, I got Chipra. Like that was the thing that comes out. And Chipra tends to be um, an accord used in perfumes that typically, I mean, there's, there's different ways to look at this, but um, typically combine some kind of citrus stuff, resins, um, and then either oak or tree moss, uh, or rock moss, something that's, uh, yeah, mossy and foresty. So when I first put this on, I get Chipra, I get like mossy, foresty, um, with the floral, and I get this real honey depth that's a little funky. And it to me is just like, it is so bold, so incredible, so unique. Um, and frankly, I'm, I'm gonna probably sound like a bit of an ageist and I would love to hear from you, you can school me. Um, but to me, this is so much gutsier, creative, um, more gender bending, artistic than I feel like 90% of today's releases. Like, so to me, this, this bridged um, the 60s and 70s uh, sheep bras. So things like, um, actually this is back to 1959, uh, Cabochard, Pablo, or Paloma, pardon me, Picasso, his daughter, um, her scent, which I think was created in 75. Halston, oh my gosh, I should know when it was created because it was my mom's signature scent. I'm pretty sure it was in the 70s too. Um, so it links kind of like the sheep bras, the, the ones that were definitely oak mossy, like that was the deal. Um, to the florals of the 80s. And so just to give you an idea of some of the other releases of 1984, um, really interesting. So um, Picasso uh, was oh, related, I think I said 1975 for this one. I think that's Halston actually. Uh, Picasso was, re uh, was released in 84, um, as was uh, Isitis, um, Coco by Chanel. Powerhouse Joy by Patou, Maggi Noir, this little baby here, and Maxims, the um, the woman's fragrance. So, to me, um, what is really magical about um, Isatis is that it kind of bridges the 70s, 60s, 70s to the 80s by combining both a floral, like a major floral structure that you would expect on its own perhaps in the 80s or 90s kind of back to the sheep rose. so you've got the oak mossy thing going on um and so the other thing I really kind of want to explore and talk about is um civet <laughs> so um in addition to in the base notes having um things like vetiver which are like stemmy kind of green foresty scent um and patchouli uh, and having this honeyed effect like amber and musk, uh, it has civet. And for those of you who aren't familiar, civet is a secretion from the, from a gland of the civet cat. And my understanding is that, um, in its raw state, like if it were hundred percent civet, it smells straight up like fecal matter um now dose down to like 
0.05 or 1% apparently, it, it just creates a depth and a composition and it kind of creates this velvety quality. And so when I smell this, so this is the arm that was just sprayed and this is earlier today. So this is way softer now, so I don't get as much forest here. But you get this like velvety, it, it reminds me of potpourri in a really good way, um, of honey. It reminds me a little of even liquor. Um, it's just got this round, warm depth. However, this is where I might not be dependable, so disclaimer. Um, there is... You probably know with things like um, cilantro, people are really split as far as if they like it or not, the herb. Some people say, like me, it smells amazing and I love to taste it in salsa. Some people say it smells like soap or tastes like soap. Some people say it tastes, or no, not taste, sorry, smells like cat pee. They're all probably right, right? Like we just have different, um, perhaps chemical composition or, or uh, experiences that lead us to what we like or don't like. Um, there's many different conversations about, for instance, musks. Um, I have a friend that cannot tolerate musk. Whenever he smells it, I will smell it and I think, oh my God, that smells heavenly. Like any musks, Kiel's musk is one of my favorite or any musk, even old Javon musk, whatever. He thinks it smells like anything from BO to really funky sex to bad breath to... I mean like the worst smells that you can conjure up um, when I smell it <laughs> I'm like in love I'm like that smells like a hug that smells amazing it smells like skin it smells like warmth it smells like somebody's mom um, and this is how I feel about things with civet um, and I know that there's such a range of reaction because I've been in a room before where other people, here's another one, um, jasmine. The way either jasmine is distilled and or the way it's represented chemically when somebody makes a chem yeah, chemical representation of it, some people say, well, it's indolic, which um, it means it has this composition um, of a certain sort. And to some people, it smells like death or it smells again like sex, or it smells like like funkiness. And um, I will be in a room with somebody who is smelling indolic jasmine or other things that apparently have this funk, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't get enough of it. It smells incredible. When in fact that person's like, what? Um, so I'll just say, all of these to me, and I think part of this also is how your nose develops when you get older. I mean, I try really hard not to be an ageist. I can't stand when people say, oh, that smells like an old lady or, you know, whatever. Um, a lot of young people who have only smelled um, gourmands, I think, can't, can't get down with this stuff. Um, however, I've also read a lot about how when people hit 30, 40, their noses start to develop and you're more into subtlety and you can kind of handle some of these tougher sense. And so I, I think I'm just way more open to these than I would have been when I was younger. Although I'll say I still even like them when I was younger because my mom wore Halston so that I equate with the warmth of my mother to, um, and I always, again, I always liked these kind of funkier, deeper scents. Um, so, um, Isatis to me is again, I think just like what is my, I mean, first of all, it's an incredible composition. Like, it's again like seeing like the most marvelous painting or hearing the most beautiful classical music you've ever heard or hearing the coolest jazz or funk. I mean, where it just blows you away because of the composition. It is so many things. I could talk about it for hours and years. I will experience it my whole life and I'll never quite capture this. That is how good it is. Um, and to me, again, what makes it really unique is that it kind of bridges, um, it harkens back to the older sheep rose of having this um, resin oak moss citrus uh, floral thing going on. Um, but it hark it also kind of tells us what's to come in the 80s and 90s by using all these interesting florals and um, combining them together. So I think this is just um, an incredible work of art. I originally, my original plan was that I was going to review this with um, many other Givenchy scents 
um, both vintage and current day. And once I started to really wear this, I thought, oh my gosh, there's just so much to say about this. It deserves its own kind of exploration. And so in the coming weeks, what I hope to do is um, compare this and contrast it to other vintage Givenchy scents to see like, are they all this amazing? Um, there's a few others that I know of that I, I know are really complex, so I look forward to that just to see like, what um, what environment was it in and are, are they all this excellent? And then to compare them to some of the modern ones. And the other thing that I want to do um, to explore this scent is to explore it against, are there modern perfumes that have the same kind of guts and have the same kind of um, un uniqueness, boldness, um, and just general, I would say, um, gutsiness, yeah. So, um, Lastly, I should say hi to my friend's mom, who my beautiful friend's mother who wears this. Uh, her name is Charlotte, and um, I'm near tears. Uh, of course, this is the most beautiful thing uh, because it's her signature scent, and I would never expect her to wear anything less than uh, the most incredible um, work of art like she is so um i look forward to learning more about this to wearing it to understanding it better hopefully and to exploring some of its sisters cousins and daughters over the coming weeks um i would love to hear from you i hope um i would love to learn from you as far as do some of you wear other Givenchy scents um, what do you think about the vintage uh, uh, compared to the newer formulations? Am I out of my mind or are the vintage ones better? Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you're wearing either the vintage or the modern interpretations, I would love to know what they are and, and why you love them. So thanks for taking me along on your journey and I hope to talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye.